Hello again, Laura. Hello, my friend. Hello again, Chris. Hiya. And hello again, Katja. Hello. Now, do you know why Brexit Cast has been brought back? It's an anniversary. Screaming popular demand? <laughs> Laura was right in that one of our bosses... Occupation is like, therapy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's wait till the end for that. Um, one of our bosses said we should have a special season where we look at what's happened since three months after the UK left the transition period and Brexit became like a proper thing. So that's what we're doing. So this is um, our contribution to the box set. Yes. And I thought, well, anniversaries come with a kind of material, don't they? So apparently your third anniversary is leather, your second oh. anniversary is cotton, <laughs> and your first anniversary is paper. So I'm just wondering, what's a three-month anniversary? A quarter of a piece of paper. A nanoparticle. <laughs> <laughs> a glass of warm white wine. <laughs> a bit of earwax. Yes, earwax, the earwax anniversary. Yes. Yes. Or an episode of Brexit Cast. <laughs> so welcome to the earwax anniversary edition of Brexit Cast, <laughs> which, by the way, is pre-recorded a little bit in advance. So if you want to know what happened five minutes ago, we will not be telling you. <laughs> this will be on a, a much higher intellectual plane. <laughs> Brexit cast. Brexit cast. From the BBC. No one's got a clue what Brexit is. Brexit is. Uh... I hadn't quite understood the full extent of this. We're particularly reliant on the Dover Calais crossing. This election blew away the argument for a second referendum. I urge everyone to find closure. Let the healing begin. I'm sorry. We will miss you. The process which I cannot describe as a dog's Brexit. Hello, it's Adam in the studio in London. It's Laura in the same studio, but two metres apart. And it's Katia in the studio in Brussels, quite far apart. And it's Chris at Westminster, down the corridor from Adam and Laura in my socially distant boutique of news. Hello, everyone. It's good to be back. And the reason, as I said, we're back is because it's a good three months now since the UK left the transition period, left the single market left the customs union and that's what our old pal Michel Barnier used to call the economic Brexit after the political Brexit of the year before when the UK actually left as a member state. So we thought this would be a good moment to kind of look back a bit, assess where we are at the moment and maybe look into the future as much as anyone can. And I thought we'd start off with a bit of class from Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission, talking on Christmas Eve do you remember that? Mm. I haven't oh, had a yes. haircut since then. Um, <laughs> and she was quoting all the greats of literature to just kind of talk about this moment. And this was the moment where they just signed the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. And to our friends in the United Kingdom, I want to say, parting is such sweet sorrow. But to use a line from T.S. Eliot, what we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. Three months later, I'm still not entirely sure what that quote means, but that's my <laughs> fault, not hers. Um, Laura, sum up what the relationship has been like in the, the first quarter of the future. Tricky. Mm -hmm. I think tricky. Tricky on Northern Ireland, tricky on vaccines, tricky and also quite spiky. Um, and unsettled, and it doesn't feel yet like it's settled into a kind of groove. I think that's fair to say for a variety of different reasons. One big caveat, because the first three months have also still been during the pandemic, I don't think we really have a sense of what a full fat Brexit end would look like because everybody's been grappling with this huge other political problem and practical problem at the same time. Katja, how does it feel at your end? Um, I would say scratchy. Uh, I think unexpectedly bumpy um, from the EU perspective. I think there had been hopes here that after sort of proper Brexit, as they call it, had been done so at the end of the year, uh, there could be the chances for, for new beginnings in the end, as uh, Ursula von der Leyen, correct pronunciation, um, uh, said um, <laughs> on Christmas Eve. Scratch. You missed me, don't you, Adam? How did I say it? Moving on. I think, you know, there was a feeling in the EU, a sort of a hope that after a, all of the political tussle of the negotiations uh, was over, that the two sides 
sides will then be able to normalise relations uh, and be able to tie up loose ends and to have a, have a much more positive relationship going forward. And that actually hasn't happened, as Laura said, for a number of reasons, which I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll now unpack. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, of course, the vaccine crisis has fed into that 100 percent. There is no way that you could see EU and UK vaccine relations without the prism of Brexit. Uh, it's just it, it's just incredible. And on some days, you know, I feel like we're right back there uh, in the old days of, of Brexit cast, kind of interpreting the both both sides and seeing each side talking right past one another once again. I wonder, though, and, and obviously it's almost too early to say, really, but how much this sort of scratchiness and bumpiness that we've seen in the last few months is actually going to be the ongoing reality, because surely there's an inevitability that there's going to be a scratchiness in the future, isn't there? I don't know, because I realised I was quite naive, because I thought... Do you remember there was that sort of idea that, oh, the EU, they're really rules-based when it comes to writing down the rules, but once the rules are in black and white, there's a little bit of leeway to to, to go around them, and like politics comes in, and it's in everyone's interest for there to be cordial relations. And, yeah, I was so naive, and it's kind of surprised me that, that things got so scratchy so quickly but then maybe I shouldn't have been surprised because you look at the people involved you look mm -hmm. at the issues involved mm -hmm. and you look at the environment I mean with vaccines it was it was life and death which and, raises the stakes mm -hmm. of what everyone has to do and while the politics are different there's still obviously always going to be politics between mm. two near, near neighbours right and while whether we're in the EU or outside the EU the UK and the continent both in geographic Europe but separated in lots of ways culturally politically intellectually uh you know separated emotionally yeah everybody wants to be friends but also it's friends and rivals and that was Absolutely. always the case which was one of the problems with the UK being inside the EU as a lot of people would have seen it and it's still one of the problems with the UK being 20 miles across the channel land border on the island of Ireland mm. but near neighbour but a real, real rival too. But it still sort of feels to me like we're at that stage where a couple have got divorced and they still kind of annoy each other when they turn up to drop <laughs> the kids off. Right? They haven't yet what? got five years down the track where they go, oh, you know what? I can't be bothered being stressed about this anymore. Let's just say hello, have a cup of tea and off we go and go about living our lives. It's still like, oh, I'm still annoyed by the fact that you took all the DVDs showing my age. <laughs> but, you know, I still, and people, I think, are still harbouring... Uh, the kind of scars, is that the right word? Yeah, I suppose that human, that know, human uh, uh, political uh, uh, desire on both sides to justify the positions they took in the previous correct. five years. Exactly. I think that's exactly that. I think, you know, that both sides, this is putting it simplistically, but have a point to prove. You know, e EU leaders still want to show that Brexit wasn't a good idea. Uh, and, you know, for the government, it's in the government's interest to show that Brexit was a great idea. So then, you know, come the vaccine crisis, for example, and the government saying, look, post-Brexit UK, we are able to sort of approve vaccines, buy our own vaccines. We've got this freedom. The EU says, well, you'd have been able to do that if you were with us. But look at your terrible history with dealing with the crisis. I mean, this is a global pandemic. And somehow it has got dragged into this post-Brexit wound-licking uh, debate. But again, it comes back to the pandemic, doesn't it? So if yeah. you want to know what the size of the queue is going to be at the airport in Alicante when you turn up as yeah. a non-EU passport holder now, well, we've not experienced that yet. The very joy or losing your mobile phone on holiday or needing medical 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 treatment because you don't have your e-hit card sure. anymore. That sort of is carrying over a bit. I think, you know, it's not going to be able... We can't judge the effects of Brexit, pandemic or not, for quite a long time to come. You can, though, be pretty sure that it has not worked out exactly as the Prime Minister used to promise. Mm. Well, that takes us nicely to our next retrospective clip, which is Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, on Christmas Eve, the day the trade deal was done, and it's not the bit where he makes that awful joke about Brussels sprouts. I thought you loved that joke. Actually, I was just trying to look cool. I thought it was an excellent Brussels sprout joke, but uh, I was trying to seem a bit more cynical. Uh, but thanks for that, Laura. Um, and it was no, he was talking about this thing that he claimed they were not going to be, but which everyone said, hang on, there's going to be loads of them. Non-tariff barriers. There'll be no non-tariff barriers to, to trade. Uh, instead, there will be a giant free trade zone of which we will at once be a member and at the same time, be able to do our own free trade deals as one UK whole and entire. Laura, remind us why people were scratching their heads a bit when he said that. 
Because there are non-tariff barriers, like Quite a lot of them. filling in forms, yeah. like export checks, like all sorts of things um, that have made a big difference to people in particular kinds of businesses. So for all that the Prime Minister wanted to say that, and it is very important that in the deal there weren't tariffs, so you know, taxes on imports and exports put on either side. But there are now, however you look at it, however you spin it, there are extra checks and therefore extra hassles for a lot of people who are trying to do business between the UK and the EU. And that became very clear very quickly, particularly by one very angry Scottish fisherman. Called Jamie McMillan, who's the managing director of Loch Fine Languistines. If Scottish exporters can't get their product to market next week, we will be at the gates of Westminster and we'll be dumping our shellfish on your doorstep, rotten the same way as a Westminster UK government is rotten to the core. Is it Langustines or Longustines, Anna? I knew as soon as I said that, I think I got it wrong. It depends how posh you are. Catcher, would you like to correct my pronunciation on that? <laughs> Langoustine. I'm not saying it like that. <laughs> Catcher, the weird thing about that is that like, EU exporters are facing much less hassle than the stuff going the other way, because actually the UK's external border with the EU keeps getting delayed, the full implementation of it. So the, so. Presumably European firms aren't complaining about this stuff. Yes, that, that's not something that, um, that, that we're hearing about um, on the EU side. I think what there is a recognition of, and you do hear that from uh, EU businesses that export um, to the UK, uh, as well as UK businesses exporting to the EU, there is this awareness that here we're not talking about teething problems. When it comes to plant and animal products, um, these are permanent problems barriers, you know, the, these non-tariff barriers. And so what the EU keeps fishing for, if you excuse, that's a terrible pun and no. it's not even comparable to Brussels sprouts. But what the EU's fishing for and has been for a long time is an agreement uh, with the UK uh, over um, plant and, and animal rules. And what they mean, of course, in the EU is harmonisation which the UK is not keen on because it wants to be able to diverge from EU rules. And so that very familiar sort of push-pull that we felt throughout the negotiations, so the EU saying, oh, it would be so much easier if we just had the same rules, mm -hmm. um, is, is back here when it comes to plant and animal products. And the crux, I guess, catcher of all of this, just to sort of boil it down, is that unless a government in the UK now or in the future is, is willing to do a bit more harmonisation and with the cost that that mean, might mean they can't do trade deals elsewhere, as you say, the, the practical reality of this for the businesses caught up in it is that this is just a, a permanent thing to get used to. It, it certainly has costs, but I think this comes back to that big debate uh, about Brexit, is that, yes, there are going to be issues like that, but, you know, the government keeps saying, wait for the upsides of Brexit, uh, and which, uh, you know, Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, was, was saying, you know, we have to wait 10 years for that. And again, if you look at trade figures and sort of, you know, if, if you see how long it's going to take the relationship to shake down, it could be, it could be five, could be 10 years, you know, we, we don't know at this stage. But there will certainly be damage done to certain small and medium businesses, um, unless there's some harm harmonisation and, you know, those who are exporting fresh produce will have a lot of difficulty. But then, you know, the government will be able to point to other upsides with Brexit. So it's it depends whether you're looking at the suffering of individual businesses and individual sectors or the broader Brexit picture, I think. Also, we should say the government jumped in quite quickly with the longwisting people with a, a fund to compensate them for disruption that they'd had in that, that window at the start of the year. So money is being spent and effort is being directed at these at these sectors but it'll be interesting to see just as the as the seasons turn and agricultural trends change do different bits of that world get caught up in these non-tariff barriers but the other thing that has kept on coming up almost every day and in fact maybe something will have happened in the time it's taken for us to record this and you to watch it um, about Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And for me, the standout quote in this actually very emotive and complicated issue um, was from Michael Gove at a select committee uh, on video from his very grand office, just painting a very Gove-esque metaphor for what the situation was like with the EU over the Northern Ireland bit of the Brexit deal. When an aeroplane takes off, uh, that's the point when you sometimes get uh, uh, that uh, increased level of turbulence. But then eventually you reach a cruising altitude um, uh, and the crew tell you to take your seatbelts off, uh, enjoy a gin and tonic and some peanuts. Um, uh, we're not at the gin and tonic and peanut stage yet, but I'm confident we will be. 
I love that. I, I see. I did love that. I, I, I have, to, I have to say that. But we're so far off the peanuts. <laughs> when, when it comes to Northern Ireland, though, I think there has been a recognition on, um, on the EU side, that basically the deal that was sold to the public, um, and you know, to, to politicians and member states and, and, and so on, as having been done on Ireland, actually wasn't ready. Uh, I think I hear that quite a lot uh, by EU diplomats and they just say, look, we, you know, it was like this. Here we go. We're ready for takeoff if we want to stay with the metaphor. And actually it wasn't. And that's why it's been so difficult to get off the ground. And it has become politically uh, so thorny and so difficult and so bad tempered. And I think that, you know, when we started off today talking about how bumpy the relations have been between the EU and the UK uh, since, you know, practical Brexit happened mm -hmm. uh, on top of legal Brexit, that, you know, Northern Ireland was what set the tone straight off. And of course, you know, then, you know, with, with the COVID pandemic. But I think, you know, there've been recriminations, big recriminations on both sides over Northern Ireland and this it's year. The, and it's the practical stuff, isn't it? I mean, inevitably, our conversations sometimes involve what seems like kind of highfalutin high politics. But I was... I was watching the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee here in Westminster the other day and Andrew Linus, the boss of the food group, Linus Food Service, was talking about mozzarella shortages in Northern Ireland. It sounds almost amusing, doesn't it? But it matters business-wise of getting cheese across the Irish Sea from Great Britain to Northern Ireland and it being held up in boxes whilst they're waiting for vets to sniff around in cardboard boxes looking at cheese but because of the nature of looking at, you know, sorting it out before a foodstuff passes into the island of Ireland. But it matters matters hugely politically as well T totally. because this has caused big concern and big problems in the unionist political sphere in Northern Ireland the DUP which of course right now is part of the power sharing agreement at Stormont which remember that didn't work for years it took a huge amount of deal to get both sides back to the table to actually have a Stormont government up and running and functioning there is now massive pressure on the DUP the unionist community has got huge concerns there have been all sorts of chatter and reporting it's never it's very hard to work out exactly what's going on but real tensions some uh, port officials were withdrawn from one shift over mm. safety concerns there's been suggestions of kind of uptick real uptick in tensions and the government in Westminster is very very worried about the politics of all of this and we can't also mention forget to mention as well that the EU pressed the nuclear button. Right. Okay. Yeah. By oh, no, hovered over the nuclear button. Well, OK. Well, they didn't go through with it, but there they... There was a bit of smoke. So, right. So, Adam, Article 16 explains to people, because this was a hugely... Seen in Westminster as a hugely aggressive move from the EU very early on. It was the end of January, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, so mm. Article 16 is the bit of the Northern Ireland Protocol in the Brexit deal. And remember, this is the Brexit deal, the divorce deal, not the trade treaty, which came later. And it's Article 16. It's called the Safeguarding Clause. And lots of treaties have these kinds of clauses. They're maybe just not quite as, as potentially dramatic as they are in this case. And it means that if there is a serious social or economic or security problem, then you can unilaterally just stop Stop applying your bit of the deal in the place where it applies. And Laura, what you were getting at was when the EU was first developing its mechanism for monitoring the export of vaccines out of the EU into other countries so they could potentially stop them and keep them in the EU, they said, oh, oh so we can make this new mechanism work in Northern Ireland. We'll use Article 16. And it got put on black and white in the proposal for about three hours. And in the three hours that it existed on black and white, the stooshy, as we would say in Glasgow, around it was enormous. And it was on a Friday night. And remember, I was watching the film of Cats at the same time. So it was a very intense <laughs> evening um, uh, watching that weird film and getting all these texts about this dramatic thing. Exactly. So I will literally never forget it. It went bonkers here. It, it did. I think, you know, when you call it an aggressive move, um, Laura, I... I, I it, I don't think it was meant to be an aggressive move at all. It was a stupid move, so something that internally in the EU um, was... I mean, people were going ballistic here. Absolutely. You know, diplomats who who worked on the Brexit negotiations, people inside the Commission who'd worked on Brexit negotiations were tearing their hair out. How do you do um, this it by was accident, seen, though? I don't get it. I, well, the assumption is it's a technocrat, you know, a suit who says, oh, there's a bit of a loophole 
uh, in this in these controls because of the special Brexit deal on Northern Ireland, uh, which means there is no hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So if the EU wants to be able to keep vaccines produced mm. in the EU, in EU territory, we have that back door there into the UK through Northern Ireland. Well, we better close it over this. But and it, off they still triggered Article the 60. Though, no, it was, they? Albeit they were, well, they, well, they pressed the button on printing were, the proposal. They never actually got so right. far as actually it becoming but, the real but, world. But, but in for, a few hours that, after that, that, they would have done. I know that doesn't matter. And, yeah. and for people it, here, yeah. it yeah. just showed, and I'm afraid it, it underlined also the kind of suspicion that people had all the way through that actually lots of people in the Commission particularly never really understood the sensitivity of Northern Ireland and Ireland. They were very happy to talk about mm. the importance of Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement, but they never really understood actually the, the you know the way that Northern Ireland is part is on the island of Ireland, but it is part of the UK. It also took away the moral high ground from exactly. the EU because if you remember exactly. the EU back in September when the government said that it may have to break international law in a in a specific and limited way mm. uh, and 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 do the same thing um, and to override parts of the Brexit agreement on Northern Ireland in order to safeguard uh, free trade in throughout the United Kingdom. And the EU went below. How can you even do that? Do you not realise how serious this is? We mm. spent so much time negotiating this agreement. And boom, on that Friday night, exactly. That was the impression that was given by the EU. Absolutely fairly. There are plenty of people in the EU who think exactly the same thing uh, as you're saying, Laura. And it also plays into uh, the critics who always said were suspicious of the EU for something else who said you talk about Northern Ireland yeah. and the peace mm. process in Northern Ireland and wanting to protect it but you're just thinking about protecting the single market. What did Ursula von der Leyen say that it was a, a mistake and she deeply regretted it all? Katja I wanted to ask how you long, what... How long did it take her to say that though? And it's what... one of the things that created a real question mark actually about her political nous mm. and her political ability because one of the things that has changed hasn't it Adam? There's a new team in charge yeah. Since this, since all our good old days of talking about Brexit, all the time. Yeah, Maros Shevkovich is um, is in charge now. He's one of the vice presidents of the Commission, and actually, there's been a change of personnel on the UK side as well. Because mm. Captain Gove of Peanut fame, um, <laughs> he's still a cabinet office minister, um, but Lord Frost, who was the the one who negotiated the trade deal, he's now taken over the running of that show. And actually, within his first week as a cabinet minister, he'd up the ante a bit on the UK side because those grace periods where the UK was delaying the full introduction of the Northern Ireland Protocol for things like pharmaceuticals, parcels and supermarket goods, he just at a stroke, extended that period before they'd be introduced until October, which for the EU was his version of Article 16. But he doesn't you get to what? spend time anymore with Michel Barnier. No. Things really have changed. And, um, he he's doesn't, but, but the he's fact writing that, a book sorry. and I'm in it. Um, what? I discovered oh, yeah. yesterday, yeah, I'm in Barnier's book. It's right not coming out until May, though. What for stalking him. I hope it's in the acknowledgements. Uh, anyway. By the way, I, I, I'm just going to throw into this, <laughs> this into the mix. I was reading Tony Connolly, our good friend from RTE in Ireland, his blog. And he was pointing out that uh, Mr... I approach this pronunciation with um, a sense of jeopardy, actually, for fear that Katja's going to put me right as well, <laughs> with Maros, Maros Sheshkovich. Um, so old Maros and Lord Frost are old muckers from the Brussels circuit going back to 2005 when the UK held the presidency of the EU. And um, he was the Slovak ambassador and Lord Frost was a British diplomat. Uh -huh. So, you know... Yes, although I, I have to say more more attention is being paid to the um, departure of Captain Gove and arrival of, of David Frost. That was seen as a clear sign here in Brussels, at least, that the government wanted to, to be quite tough uh, with the EU when it came to implementing uh, the Brexit deal on Northern Ireland. Uh, David Frost's reputation here is, is one, if one of... He's been described to me as a Brexit ideologue and he's seen as, as being quite inflexible. That's the reputation he has here. And so his arrival was seen as sort of uh, a snapshot of, of tougher days to come ahead. Well, talking about the future, because we've got to go soon, what things will you be looking out for in the next three months and the three months after that and the three months after that and the three months after that? Isn't it all about scratchiness and how scratchy it is? I mean, it's back to where we were at the start, isn't it? To what extent does that level out as a normal or are we in this sort of beginnings of a new thing and so things might smoothen out? It's the old either scratchiness or Michael Gove's plane thing again. Peanuts thing. When do we get to the peanuts? 
When do you get well, to isn't the film? It quite, isn't it quite useful to have uh, the EU to bash, though, still, when, when mm. needed? You know, I mean, is, is there an incentive? It, it, doesn't, it, doesn't it work quite well for the Prime Minister, for example, to, uh, in, when it comes to the vaccine debate, to, to keep out of it, to not attack the EU? Uh, to, yeah, to that's the opposite of bashing. The, 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 and that's what that's yeah, the, the moral has been. high ground. Yes, but on the other hand, um, you have the newspapers that bash Brussels and you have cabinet ministers mm. who might be tougher on, on the EU or, or in Brussels. Isn't it quite a useful sort of... I think it is for some, isn't ...political it? tool to have? I think it is for some, but I just, I just don't think it's going to be as relevant anymore. I think it's already a lot less relevant and actually it's the vaccines tensions that have put it really back into totally. yeah, yeah. people's... Her view, there's a posh word. Mm. Um, but for me, I think the key thing I'm really going to be looking out for actually is what happens over Northern Ireland because the stability for the rest, for, for the relations inside the UK and the stability between the two communities in Belfast uh, and, in, and around Stormont has got really big, big, big implications. And I think that's hugely important. And one other tiny thing, mm. if I can, I'm nerdily interested in what the rising generation of politicians here in Westminster and Brussels are going to start saying about Brexit, if anything. How Subject much do the next lot want to put... Yeah, yeah, right. How much do people want to turn the page? And on that point about Northern Ireland, and, okay. even once the practical yeah. problems are solved, it will still be a political issue because guess what? Right. There's elections to the Stormont Assembly next year. Guess what? Right. The DUP right. will run on a platform of junking the protocol. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Two years after that, Stormont they then has a review. vote on yeah. whether to keep the protocol or not. And, and it'll be fascinating because I reckon the British government will be neutral on whether the people of Northern Ireland, through their assembly members, should support the protocol. And I guess the EU will be in favour of the protocol because they think it's necessary. So we'll have that... It'll have that tension. And structurally, in power sharing, you've got the DUP, which looks to the UK, and you've got Sinn Féin, which looks to the EU. And therefore, that tension is absolutely baked into Forever. Stormont before you even start thinking about mm. what the EU are up to. Remember that the EU still hasn't, the, the European Parliament still hasn't ratified uh, the Brexit deal, the, you know, the trade agreement. So we're waiting for that. There are whispers that that could be then used as a possible reset moment uh, between the two sides in their grabbing for the peanuts. I think that's very unlikely, I have to say, some big moment. You know, we've had supposed big moments before and it's sort of a bit of a damp squib at the end of the day or a damp langoustine. Um, but I think that what... Some suggest on both sides, actually, uh, to me, is that it wouldn't take very much to get rid of some of the bumps when uh, it, it, it comes sort of to the practicalities between the two sides. I mean, for example, um, you know, musicians or actors, their free movement, can some deal be done? What about easing the movement of, of guide dogs for the blind if they're going to travel between the EU and the UK? Uh, could something be done about the status of, of the EU's uh, non-ambassador, ambassador, ambassador um, to, to, to the UK or vice versa. It's quite small things where agreements could be found quite easily that really could improve that mood music on both sides. Um, now, my friends, we leave you as always with the feeling that a deal could be done <laughs> <laughs> and with thoughts of damp langoustines and balls of dusty peanuts. And the and risk of no deal. Earwax. It's a vintage yes. Brexicast. Yes. Happy earwax anniversary, <laughs> one oh. and all. It's been a good one. Oh, it's the most romantic thing anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Brexitcast. Brexitcast. From the BBC.